as I said last week, we saw the, the vision, this week the interpretation, and the interpretation is really important. I once went to a um, Welsh language conference where all of the talks were in, in Welsh, and one of my friends was in a little booth at the side uh, translating from the Welsh into the English, which then those of us whose Welsh is particularly bad were sat in the congregation with little headsets, not too dissimilar to this, and we were hearing the, the English translation as it was being simultaneously translated as the conference went on. I was reading this week about uh, a translator who did that kind of work, and at the end of a conference address came out of their little booth to find a, a gentleman arguing with one of the stewards because they were desperate to keep their translation headpiece and they were saying look I need this because I, I'm not from here I don't speak the language and I'm going out for a meal tonight and I want to know what's being said <laughs> at the beginning of of this half of the chapter verse 15 Daniel is struggling to understand what's been happening in the vision and so God sends him an interpreter to make it plain, notice uh, four things about this interpreter, all beginning with A. First of all, they're angelic, we're told. Uh, and behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. This is often how angels appear, especially in the Old Testament. There's something not quite human about them, and yet they have the appearance of a man. And so you think of the men who appeared to Abraham, or the, the man appearing to Samson's parents. And we know it's an angel, there's no doubt about it, because his name is revealed. Verse 16, this is Gabriel. Second A is that this has been arranged, Gabriel is sent. Verse 16, I heard a, a man's voice between the banks of the Uliot called Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Angels are ministering spirits. They, they live to serve God. And we're told it's a man's voice that calls out from between the banks of the canal. That's interesting, isn't it? The voice is coming from the, the waters. Uh, and, and John Calvin rightly points out this is the voice of our Lord Jesus speaks with the voice of a man and yet has authority to, to command this angel to, to tell Daniel exactly what the vision means. The third A is awesome. And I'm looking at verse 17. Gabriel comes near to Daniel and his response is to hit the deck. And so we get a sense of the angel's purity. You know, Daniel isn't in God's presence here and, and yet even being near to God's holy messenger is enough to fill him with a sense of his own unworthiness and impurity. And then the fourth A, verse 18, is this angel is attractive. And, and I mean the way that he deals with Daniel. In all of his power and purity, he's so admirable. Look how gently he interacts with this man who's just floored by his appearance. Verse 18, when he spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep. So there's this passing out, my face to the ground, but he touched me. There's that gentleness. Touched me and made me to stand up. Now you think back to that guy who's trying to hold on to his translation headset and just imagine for a second how great it would be to you know if it actually worked like that that you could have this headpiece in uh, and, and no matter where you were you could understand what was going on so you could walk with Eleanor into a, a Parisian cafe or into a sushi bar in Tokyo and understand everything that's being said or how about one that translated the real meaning of what people said to you and so you know when your your husband says I'm almost ready. You'd know what that actually means. Or, or when your wife says, just do whatever you want, you, you know, you'd have this response saying, this is a real test of your decision-making ability. <laughs> well, how about a personal translator that helped you to understand everything that's going on in the Bible? Wouldn't that be something great? And would it surprise you if I said that's exactly what God has given you? Daniel got an angel, but to you he's given something better. His own spirit. Like the angel, his spirit is holy, but so much more holy. It's his God. Like the angel, he's sent by God. And he's awesome in power and yet so gentle. One of the evidences, the outworking of his work in your life is gentleness. 
is the spirit of gentleness. And that spirit lives in your heart, Christian. Remember John 16, 13, Jesus told his disciples, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. So that's the work of the Holy Spirit, taking these words and making them live. It's not the work of a great communicator. It's not the work of a good preacher. When we come away understanding something new from God's word, we've, we've got to be saying, oh, thank you, Father, for sending your Holy Spirit. Helps me to grasp and grapple with and understand these things. Perhaps you say, but hey, look, I, I understand that, but I still find the Bible really hard to understand. And I just want to put this question before you, because yes, it does take work, and there's nothing wrong with that. It takes effort and searching the scriptures and, and, and looking into these things. But the big question I'd want to put before you is this. Do you want to understand it? Will you prove that by working at it. Look at Daniel in verse 15. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. I want to know what's going on here. And so God sends an angel because his servant wants to know his word. And I'd ask you that question. Are you really trying to understand God's word? Because he promises he who seeks will find. He sent an angel to Daniel and, and the same God will help you. You know, God is not like the, the gods of Eastern mysticism. He doesn't love mystery. He doesn't delight in the obscure. Our God is a God of revelation who loves to make things known, loves to reveal his will and to satisfy, satisfy those who seek it. Now let's come back to our, our text and ask them, what does the angel Reveal. Looking now at verse 20 through to 25. You've seen those portraits and I've talked to you about them before where you've got the, the image of a person and, and when you come close and look at it, it's actually made up of lots of smaller pictures. And so you'll have, say, like a, a picture of a famous movie star or Darth Vader and it's made up of lots of stills from the, the Star Wars films. And so you're looking at the same image that you saw from a distance but you're, you're getting a lot more information and a lot more detail. In this section, we, we get a repeat of what we saw last week, but a lot more detail as well. So let's quickly recap as we go through verse 20 to 23, and then we'll take time to break down the, the additional information that we get. So verse 20, we're told the ram that Daniel saw is Persia. It's two horns, the two ethnic groups that make up that empire, Media and Persia. Verse 21, the goat is Greece and this big horn is the first king, Alexander the Great. Verse 22, what was united under Alexander, remember we looked at those maps last time, that whole empire united under Alexander at his death after that initial power struggle is divided among four of his generals, none of which have his power. That's quite detailed, isn't it? Verse 22, as for the horn that was broken, in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. None of those four kings could unite the empire or have the same kind of military success that Alexander had had. Verse 23, then right at the end of the Greek empire, out of those one of those four kingdoms arises a new horn, a little horn. And we saw how last week the prophecy is so clearly speaking about the Seleucid, the Seleucids were one of those four empires, the Seleucid king Antiochus Epiphanes. Now Antiochus dies in 176 BC and 30 years later, 146 BC, Greece is conquered. So when we read in verse 23, and at the latter end of their kingdom, it really is. You know, again, precise detail we're being given here centuries before it happened. It really was at the end of the Greek Empire when Antiochus rises and is put down. So that's our recap. Bit of a refresh, and if you weren't here last week, it's not going to make an awful lot of sense, but I'd encourage you to go back and have a look at the YouTube video and, and fill yourself in on the first half of the chapter. But now we get the uh, additional information, and we're told a lot more about this little horn, Antiochus Epiphanes. 
notice three characteristics, three things about him. First, verse 23, we read that he's a king of bold face. So the first thing we're taught about this man is that he's haughty, confident, proud. I was listening to Donald Trump speaking before his recent visit to Scotland and the UK, and whatever you think of him, whatever you say about him, whether you're pro or anti, what you can't deny is the man loves to brag. No, he's saying, I'm going to Scotland, they love me there. I've got property there. Well, I've got property all over the place. Loves to brag. And in the same way, we've got Antiochus strutting across the pages of history. The book of Maccabees, which is one of the apocryphal books. It's a Jewish history account written at the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. Not scripture, but helpful history. In chapter 1, verse 24, it says, of Antiochus, he committed deeds of murder and spoke with great arrogance. This is something he was known for. Second characteristic is that he understands riddles, verse 23. I admire anybody who can do a cryptic crossword. They absolutely baffle me and my father-in-law can do one in minutes and I just have to look at anybody who can complete them and think that they're a genius. And, and, and what we're seeing here is Antiochus is a man with that kind of mind. He can understand riddles and it doesn't so much mean that he's intelligent, although that is very much part of it, but that he's cunning. If you're using a, a New King James Version, I think it says he understands dark sentences. He's a man of mystery and intrigue, a trickster who likes twisting words and using deception. The third thing we see about him in verse 24 is that he has great power. And until, remember last week I told you the story about how he invaded Egypt and met the Roman ambassador who drew a circle around him in the sand. Until that point, Antiochus had known great success in his battles, he'd only known victory, and those victories were admired not just in his Seleucid corner of the Greek Empire, but across the whole empire. He was a man looked up to as a guy of influence and real strength. He really did, as scripture says, 300 years before him, have great power. Then see three actions. First, in verse 24, we're told that he succeeds in what he does. He destroys mighty people and even those called the saints. Last week we again saw how that happened. And I read a big section to you of Antiochus' awful persecution of the Jews. Because they refused to abandon their culture and become Greek, he crushed them. He executed babies that had been circumcised along with their families. At one point he slaughtered 80,000 Jews and enslaved another 80,000. He wiped out anyone who was determined to hold on to their Jewish identity. There's one story in the book of Maccabees about a, a mother who has all of her sons, 12 sons, murdered in front of her because she refuses to deny her faith in Yahweh. And this is done under the command of Antiochus's um, underlings, his generals and officers. This is a man who really did succeed in doing awful things, destroying mighty men and destroying the saints. Verse 25, second thing, he by cunning makes deceit prosper and magnifies himself in his heart. You know that saying that a con man becomes a madman when he believes his own lies. It's one of the most dangerous things that you can fall into if you want to kid people for a long time is believing your own lie. And deceit was so ingrained in Antiochus' life and rule that he really did fall into that trap. He believed what he had had stamped on his coins, Antiochus Theo Epiphanes. Antiochus, God incarnate. Although many of his contemporaries called him Antiochus Epimenes, which means madman. The third thing that this little horn that Antiochus would do, and that he absolutely did, was that without warning, verse 25, he destroys many. 
Now this happened in two ways. Antiochus did this in a very kind of subtle way by promoting Greek culture, turning the Jews away from their historic faith and life of following Yahweh and encouraging them to adopt Greek practices. But it happened much more explicitly as well. One verse in the Maccabees just really deals with this so clearly when it says, Deceitfully he spoke peaceable words to them and they believed him, but he suddenly fell upon the city. And so he's telling the city of Jerusalem, No, we're not coming in. We're not going to do anything wicked or vile. And then while they're relaxed and not expecting it, it carries on, dealt it a severe blow and destroyed many people of Israel. And so the fulfillment of these things is incredible. But then I want you to see at the end of this, uh, towards the end of this text, two things that are done to him. So we saw three characteristics, three things he did, and two things that were done to him. Firstly, verse 24 again. We see Antiochus came to power by God's will. See, amazingly, his power will be great, verse 24, but not by his own power. Amazingly, Antiochus, this great persecutor of God's people, isn't a self-made man. He doesn't come to power by his own strength because God is responsible for his rise. He uses cunning and deceit, but without the providence of God, he would achieve nothing. Now hold that on one side of the balance and on the other side hold this. Antiochus came to power by God's will. Verse 25, Antiochus came to nothing by God's will. There are a number of accounts of how he died. The Jewish propaganda says that he was running from battle, fell from his chariot, broke every bone in his body and died in torturous pain. The Seleucid record says that after a defeat he honorably committed suicide by throwing himself into sea. But it seems that the, the reality of the situation from, from the historical accounts is that actually he suddenly died of an unknown disease. And so just as the stone not cut by human hands, that stone of questionable origin in Nebuchadnezzar's dream comes rolling out of nowhere and brings down the empires of the world. So the troubler of God's people is brought to nothing by their God. Now before we apply with this, and before we bring it home to us, let's first just deal with a potential problem. Because in verse 17, Gabriel tells Daniel that this is a vision about the time of the end. And many Christians get very excited about those words and assume that we're dealing with a prophecy that's focused on the end times. But that doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit with everything else that we're seeing because Gabriel very clearly identifies these two animals, the ram and the goat, as the empires of Persia and Greece. And Antiochus fits so neatly and perfectly into this description that we're given, rising out of one of those four kingdoms, doing everything that he did, being everything that he was, and having those things done to him that he had done to him. It's all so neat. And so if we're saying then Gabriel is talking about the end times here, something has gone horribly wrong. Either the end times have happened 2,100 years ago and we all missed it, or this is all going to happen again. And so what, what is happening here? What does Gabriel mean by the end times? There's only one option that makes sense of this. And it's that Gabriel's talking about the end of the old covenant. That this vision is about these special troubles that come before everything is shaken up and made new in the coming of the Messiah. Now that becomes very plain when we look at verse 17 through to 19. So he came near where I stood. When he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep, face to the ground. He touched me, made me stand up. He said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation 
for it refers to the appointed time of the end. So I'm talking about an end time that's to do with this indignation. You know that word means anger and wrath. And earlier on in verse 13, we were told that all of this persecution came on God's people because of transgression. There was sin, there was failure which provoked this indignation from God. See, God's patience with Israel's disobedience, their determination to turn their back on Him and worship other gods has been exhausted. And so this final tribulation comes at the end of the Old Covenant. Right at the end, the worst persecution that Israel had known. Remember last week that quote from John Lennox that Nebuchadnezzar, he'd been bad. And, and Belshazzar had been bad and Darius had been bad but they'd only ever poked at the Jews they'd only ever made rules not directly at them but ones like well you can't worship any other god apart from me and so it was kind of a passive aggressive move against the Jews not really aimed at destroying them but now Antiochus is like nothing they've experienced before here is a king of incredible power determined to wipe them out and so here is this really, really dark night, the darkest night in the experience of Israel. And that doesn't surprise us at all, does it? Because it comes before the most glorious dawn in the advent of the Messiah. Let's apply this then. What is this text saying to us? Well, I want to say some things about God's word because that's what it's really focusing on that's where the, the push is through all of this first thing I want to say is this God's word must be preserved verse 26 the vision of the evenings and the mornings that have been told is true and this is Gabriel's last command but seal up the vision for it refers to many days from now and so Gabriel tells Daniel that what he has seen is going to be vitally important for many days from now when we were in Indonesia, we stayed in this, this little um, stone mining village and the, uh, the imam, the religious leader of the village, um, brought out this wicker ring and, and he showed it us because this wicker ring is used to settle conflicts in the village. If there's a disagreement, no matter how bitter, as soon as the ring comes out and is put down between the opposing parties, the, the, um, the argument stops. And the listening starts. Now something that's that powerful, something that can restore peace to the village, it needs to be kept safe. And so it had its own special, quite ornate box in the imam's house. Daniel has been given a word from God that is here to ensure the future of God's people. That's how vital this is. You know, we think about when we're reading the Bible, we're reading important words. These words are the, the thing that saved God's people in the, in the hardest time, that protected the faith of the remnant in the toughest situation. And so it needed to be stored for difficult times ahead. Now, you and I, we have an incredibly precious resource in these words, in our Bibles. You remember what the Lord Jesus said when he spoke to his disciples, all this I have told you so that you will not fall away. How foolish would, be, would we be then not to treasure it and read it and learn it? His words are key to our avoiding failure as Christians, our key to surviving as church. So here's my challenge to you. Have you been keeping it safe? What do I mean by that? Well, are you a smart enough person? Are you a wise enough person to learn from another Christian's experience. Alison told me that as she was comforting Murray in the last few days, the one thing that she wished was that she knew more scripture by heart. Not just to be able to, to as we all do, quote, you know, oh, the Bible says somewhere this, is, but be able to know it and say for certain, here's what, here's what the Lord Jesus said. Here's what the Apostle Paul wrote. Here's what the Holy Spirit inspired, inspired the writers of, of God's Word to write. See, it's, it's that kind of thing. It's knowing these words that sustains you in the toughest times. 
And you've all known trials. You've all known incredible difficulties. Some of you have known things that I hope I never have to endure. And you would testify as well. It was God's Word that was so helpful, so encouraging, so sweet to me. If we really believe these chapters and believe the context in which they're given and the context for which they're given, that Daniel had to store this and keep it safe. And if we believe what we read in chapter 7 about tougher times coming for the church, well then we should be doing the same. We're going to need these words, just as there was persecution before Jesus came the first time, before he came in obscurity. There's going to be an even darker night than what Antiochus bought for the church before he returns in glory. Are you preparing for that? Preserving, storing up God's word now. Second point of application. So, God's word must be stored. God's word must impact us see how this affected Daniel verse 27 I Daniel was overcome and lay sick for some days then I rose and went about the king's business but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it you know it's okay to be shaken by a sermon this word from God made Daniel so sick he couldn't work you know it's okay to be moved to incredible discomfort by God's word, by reading your Bible, it's often a good indication that you've heard from God. People so often say, God told me to do this with a big smile on their face and a a skip in their step, but that wasn't Daniel's experience. And it wasn't Jonah's experience, and it wasn't Peter's experience, it wasn't the bar's experience when they're called to Burkina Faso. They couldn't believe it at first. We've got to uproot and take our little girls to, to West Africa. It's disturbing. And God's word is often like that. But don't miss why Daniel is disturbed. See, the reason he's so shaken is not because he's going to lose his comfortable life in Belshazzar's palace. Because he's told this is for many days from now. In other words, this is way into the future. It's not something that you personally, Daniel, are going to have to probably worry about. So why then is he so shaken? Well, the simple answer is this. He loves God and he loves God's people and he sees in this persecution the defamation of God's house the destruction of his people the despoiling of the daily sacrifice for 2,300 days God won't be worshipped as he deserves and that to Daniel is unthinkable Daniel's love for God meant he wanted God to get what he deserved now what about you? Would it really shake you if I said in 200 years from today, for six years, there will be no church? Would that make you so sick you couldn't go to work tomorrow? No. I don't think it would. What if I was to say after tonight, we actually can't have church here for the next six weeks? Would that bother you? If not, we have to ask that question. Is it because I'm thinking more about myself And even if I'm frustrated by that, is it because of the interruption to my routine and because I'm going to miss spending time with these people and these friendships and I'm not actually thinking about God and His glory and that He deserves the worship that's brought by His people on Sunday? Third point of application. God's Word revealed the future. There are some things that you'd rather not know, like what goes into Savaloy's, what part of a chicken is the nugget, Maybe you look at these, these two chapters and you see God revealing the future to his old covenant people. And you see God revealing the future to his new covenant people. And we see the things that are in the pipeline ahead and you start to say, you know what, I'd rather not know. God is doing you, he's showing you incredible grace. He's doing something wonderful for you by showing you the future so that you can prepare. It is an immense blessing that God has given us these words. Let me explain. 
If Sarah hides in a wardrobe at home to scare me, she doesn't do this all the time, don't worry. Uh, she's never done it, so I don't know why all the time you're going to assume that on the odd occasion Sarah's in a wardrobe. Not true. Just for the sake of an illustration. If she jumps in a wardrobe, she's going to jump out and scare me. I I'm going to get a fright. But if I see her slinking into the wardrobe, or Andrea texts, sees Sarah and texts me and says, well, Sarah is hiding in the wardrobe, I've got three options. I can open the wardrobe door and she can say boo and I can not flinch and be all stoic and take all the fun out of what she's doing. I can open the wardrobe quickly and scare her. Or I can tie a rope around the handles and leave her in there for a couple of hours. <laughs> wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. You don't do it either. In one scenario, I've got one bad option. Get scared. In the other, I've got three fantastic options. <laughs> And the only thing making a difference is I know. I know what's coming. See, knowing what's ahead, even if it's just a vague idea, I don't even have to know which wardrobe she's in. If I'm told she's in a wardrobe, that makes all the difference. Just a vague idea makes all the difference. During the Second World War, Japanese propaganda told its people, no bombs will fall on Tokyo. And so when they did, the people went into panic because they were totally unprepared. God is so kind in telling us the truth about what we will face if we follow Jesus. Are you listening? Four, God's word hints at a greater future. And this should really excite us because we can't read the name Gabriel without thinking of a greater future. Revelation, without thinking of another great revealing. That in 500 years after appearing to Daniel, this same angel is sent to Galilee to two men with news of great joy. You're both going to have babies, little boys. And Zacharias will be called John, and he will make way for the Messiah. And Joseph's boy will be called Jesus, because he will save his people. Now, do you remember what Zacharias said? when John was born. See, after being struck dumb, and I think this is part of God's genius here, we ask that question, why is Zachariah struck dumb? Well, when you can't speak, you've got to listen, right? And you've got time to think about things and ponder what's going on. And so Zachariah has had this time to reflect on a visit from an angel called Gabriel, who he knows long ago appeared to a man named Daniel with news of vicious beasts of horns and trampling of the people of God. Here's Zechariah's response. Luke chapter 1, 68, 69. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. It's beautiful. Because where the horns of men are destructive and domineering, this horn raised by God, Jesus Christ, is a horn of salvation, a horn of peace and blessing and reconciliation with God, redemption from sin. Fifthly and finally and very briefly, God's word fuels our joy in Christ. Because there's another prophecy about Jesus' birth. And in all of this talk of horns and powers and empires, you just can't miss it. And so as we finish the second half of this first mountain, one side chapter 7, one side chapter 8, and all of this talk of empire building, of the arrogance of man, the power of the proud, the suffering of God's people. Let these two chapters deepen your appreciation of Jesus coming as I read these words from Isaiah chapter 9, 1 to 7. Well-known prophecy. We read it at Christmas time because it's about the coming of our Savior. Here we are. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, 
but in the latter time he is made glorious by way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. You think of the darkness of Antiochus' reign. And yet it's these people who see a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy in the harvest. And they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace. You think of these beasts and four successive governments and nations and ten horns of successive governments and nations and little horns of successive governments and nations and all they bring is destruction and defilement of the increase of his government and of peace. There will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's finish there.